The goal of this video is to explore various definitions we use to describe the extreme values of a function, that is, the highest and lowest values a function can attain. So we'll start by uh, looking at the language for this simple example here. Here's a function, the graph of a function f, and we might say that the maximum value of f is 6. It's the greatest value that this function can attain. We might also say that the argument 2 maximizes the value of f. In other words, 2 is the number you would plug into the function to get the maximum value. Or put another way, the maximum value of f occurs at 2. So you should make sure that you are tuned into the distinction between finding an argument that maximizes the function or actually talking about the maximum value. Similarly, you can play the same game with minimum values. So the minimum value of f in this example is negative 2, but the argument that minimizes the value of f is 7, or put another way, the minimum value of f occurs at 7. So what we want to do is set up an, a notion here uh, more general. So here's an argument c, and you'll notice that if we were just to restrict our attention to a little neighborhood of c, just arguments nearby c, then if we had that sort of narrow view, well, it sure looks like it's a maximum value. So notice there's this open interval we can construct around C, and we make the observation that for every argument x inside that nice open interval we just wrote down, it's true that the function value at C is greater than or equal to the function value at x. Now, you could ask, well, why greater than or equal to? Don't you want to just say greater than? Well, you could have chosen x to b c, in which case it's obviously going to be equal to, f of x will be equal to itself. So we really do want to allow that flexibility. So we're going to keep that there in our definition. So for every x in the open interval, f of c is greater than or equal to f of x. Now, we would say in this case that f of c is the maximum value relative to nearby values, right? Relative to just things you can get nearby, f of c is as big as you're going to get or f of c is a maximum value locally, is another way to put that. So here we are back at the bigger picture, and we'll notice that in the big picture, there is an argument d where f of d is bigger than f of c. So in other words, a locally maximum value of f need not be the maximum value of f when you look around its whole domain, okay? What's key is you can build this interval around the argument and on that interval the function value is as big as it's going to get. That's what we mean when we say we have a locally maximum value. So this is going to inspire definition. This is, this is what we mean by relative maximum. So suppose the function f has domain d. We say f has a relative maximum or a synonym is local maximum at the argument c if there exists an open interval i such that c the argument in question sits inside of that nice open interval which in turn sits inside the domain and for every x in that open interval f of c is greater than or equal to f of x so if we go back to our example you should notice that there are actually three relative maxima in this example. There are three spots on the graph where you can build intervals on which the function value at that argument in question is as big as it's going to get. So f in this case has relative maxima at c1, c2, and c3. And another way of saying that is f has local maxima. Local and relative are synonyms. Now we could go back to this definition and there's a very obvious modification. What if instead of maximum we wanted minimum? So we gotta swap out maximum for minimum and now what's the only thing we really have to change in this definition? Instead of f of c being greater than or equal to f of x we need to swap that out for less than or equal to f of x. So it's almost identical as a definition and that's what we'll mean by relative minimum. So back to our example it's pretty clear that there are going to be two relative minima at the argument c4 and c5 in this case, or, or, or we can say f has local minima at c4 and c5. Now, a very natural question to ask, if you haven't already asked it, what about the endpoint? Does that count 
as a relative minimum. This is one of those matters that comes down to what you decide to define it to be. It's, it's not intrinsically defined. We have to make a choice. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our definition and see what the definition says about it. So in our definition, we decided there had to be an open interval i for which all these things happen. In other words, there has to be a sampling interval that's going to be a subset of the domain. Let's see if we can do that. Here we're going to zoom in on the endpoint, and now you start seeing the problem. Here's the argument C. We'd like to perhaps say this is the local minimum, but the problem is once we build that open interval I, and we check this condition, well, C is inside the open interval, but the open interval isn't inside the domain. It's sticking out. And you might say, well, let's just shrink the interval, but that doesn't happen. I mean, that doesn't help us. So we can't sample from this side, and it really doesn't matter if we shrink. Shrinking the interval doesn't help. There's no way to build this sampling interval. So any open interval that contains this endpoint isn't going to fit inside the domain. So really, we shouldn't count endpoints as relative extrema. Now you may well have a situation where a textbook or a teacher have decided actually to count these as relative extrema and you'll have to negotiate that if you run into it but we're not going to use that definition we're going to go by this definition where endpoints do not count as a relative minima nor a maxima so taken together relative maxima and relative minima can be called one thing relative extrema so when we refer to relative extrema we mean either maxima or minima one or the other so let's return to our example. We want to make just a couple more definitions. Here we have a function with three relative maxima, and we're going to notice that of these, there is an actual largest value throughout the domain. And we would say f has an absolute maximum at c1. No matter where you looked in the domain, c1 is the argument that's going to give you the maximum value. Or another way to say this is f, f has an, a global maximum at c1. So this inspires the following definition, absolute maximum. Suppose the function f has domain d. We say that f has an absolute maximum or global maximum at c if for every x in the domain, wherever you're looking, f of c is greater than or equal to f of x. Please note, c can be anywhere in d, including an endpoint. So this time, endpoints definitely count for the purposes of finding absolute or global maximum or minimum. And indeed, here's the definition for absolute minimum. You just swap out the obvious and notice that f of c is going to be less than or equal to f of x in this case. OK, let's test drive all these definitions. Here's a function. The domain of this function is this nice closed interval. We will notice that there are three relative extrema, of which two are relative maxima, and one is a relative minimum. There is an absolute max that occurs at this argument, and there is an absolute min that occurs at the endpoint over here. Endpoints can count for the purposes of absolute minima or maxima. How about the exponential function e to the x? The domain in this case is the set of all real numbers. Now, there's no greatest value that's certainly obvious. And there's no minimum value either, because as x goes to negative infinity off to the left, the function value gets closer to 0, but it keeps decreasing as you head out to the left. So there's no absolute extrema. There's neither an absolute max nor an absolute min. And since the function increases on the real axis, there's no relative peak or relative valley either. So this function has no relative extrema. How about the quadratic function 1 quarter x squared? Once again, the domain is a set of all real numbers. Now, f has both a relative and absolute minimum at x equals 0. But in this case, f has neither relative maxima nor an absolute maximum. How about the cubic function 1 third x cubed minus 2x? Once again, the domain is all real numbers. 
Now in this case, f has no absolute extrema because you can make the function value as great as you want and you can also make it um, very large in absolute value and negative by choosing arguments to the left and right. But it's pretty clear there are actually there is a relative min and a relative max in this case. And finally, let's take a look at sine of 3x. Now in this case, there are actually infinitely many relative minima and infinitely many relative maxima. And actually, f attains its absolute maximum value infinitely often as well as its absolute minimum infinitely often. Now we're gonna finish with a word of warning. Discontinuities tend to really complicate the analysis of extrema. And we're just gonna look at one simple, simple example. Here's a function f, the domain is a closed interval, but you'll notice there's a discontinuity at c. How do we recognize this discontinuity? Well, is it true that the limiting value as x approaches c of f of x is actually equal to f of c? Well, no, it's not true because the limiting value doesn't even exist, so there's no chance of this. This is an honest discontinuity. Now watch what happens when we ask the question, relative, what's the, is there a relative maximum at C? All right, that's the question. Is there a relative maximum at C? So we look close to the argument C and we could build a nice interval that satisfies all the criteria we need. It's a nice sampling interval. And is it true that the value at C is going to be greater than or equal to the value f of x anywhere nearby. And of course that's false because we can always choose x close by where f of x is larger. So there's no way to do this. And shrinking the interval doesn't really help the situation. You can't just shrink the interval to make that work. So what's going on? Why is this failing? We, this should, some sense, quote unquote, this value we'd like this to be the maximum value. But of course, it's, it's, it's the limiting value of the function as you sneak in from the left of the argument C. The problem is that value, which we'd like to claim as the maximum value, isn't actually a value of the function. What's going on is the function's discontinuous, so the limiting value doesn't actually match up with the function value. So discontinuities really make analysis of maxima and minima more subtle. You'll notice, by the way, we didn't have to even talk about relative. There's just no absolute maximum value in this case. So it's a very strange function. But all we have to do is redefine the value. What if we redefine the value of the function at C like this? And now suddenly everything's restored in the sense that now F has both a relative and absolute maximum value at C. So discontinuous functions can be sort of slippery. Well, in truth, what we're going to do is study the properties of continuous functions. Those are the functions that have nice theorems that we can state about relative extrema, and that's what we'll do in the next few videos.